All right, well, the FBI has confiscated Mike Lindell, the MyPillow guy's phone, and they did it at a fast food restaurant. It's too bad we don't have a promo code. <laughs> <laughs> promo code Hardy's Biscuits. Anyway, so they, uh, they, they confiscated his phone, and, and look... Between that, between the raid on Mar Largo, between what's going on with Bannon, a lot of other things. And, and look, maybe some people are guilty of stuff. Maybe they're not. Maybe it's politically motivated. But what we're going to talk about today is kind of a different angle on this from what everybody else is discussing. Because what's interesting and what a lot of people on the left are critiquing conservatives over, there's like, oh, yeah, you guys are all back the blue until it's one of your guys getting raided. And then all of a sudden you want to defund the FBI. So we're going to discuss today, does the left have a point? with respect to what they're talking about on the conservative, you know, affection for law enforcement in general has back the blue gone too far. We're going to discuss all of that today and we're going to give you the answers and the arguments that you need to be able to effectively debate from a conservative perspective on everything from law enforcement to criminal justice. All of that coming up on this episode. Welcome to this episode of Making the Argument. If you haven't already, head down to the description of this podcast and join us on Volley. I think you'll like the angles we are taking today. As Nick said, we hope that you leave more informed to make the argument for what you believe. And we look forward to looking at your comments on the YouTube channel and your reviews on Apple Podcast. All right, Nick Freitas, your host, member of the Virginia House of Delegates. And I'll specifically mention for this episode, I'm also... Um, a member of the Public Safety Committee in the House of Delegates and the Courts of Justice Committee. So when it comes to Do both the creation of the laws, criminal and civil, were you going to ask me for a greater explanation on what that I, I was. <laughs> yeah, because when you said Public Safety Committee, I immediately thought guillotines and. <laughs> I was thinking. I was thinking. I was revolution. thinking speed cameras. Yeah. Oh, actually, that does come before myself. But I am on the Public Safety Committee, which largely deals with kind of like law enforcement, um, gun laws. You know, safety cameras, stuff like that, speed cameras, red light cameras, blah, blah, blah. And then courts of justice, which handles all of our civil and criminal law. So I, I do get kind of a seat on what goes on in those areas. And hopefully we'll be able to use some of that experience to the benefit of our audience today. And then, of course, with us is my lovely wife, Tina, queen of the bees. Hello, everyone. All right. And then we have Christian, our uh, resident historian and political prognosticator. Hey, Gosh, you guys are just a... We're so excited. I'm sorry. I'm just... I, we were talking before the show about the political trends in Clark County, and now I'm just like... Oh, gosh. Okay. I'm moving <laughs> on. And, of course, we have producer of producers, we, Nick Hamilton. We were also Hamilton. talking about Hardee's. I, you I know just, what? I, I, you I, know what? I just, Silence. I'm not done with your introduction. <laughs> when I'm done with your introduction... Okay. Hardy, producer, please, producer. Please Hamilton. continue. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to beat him with this microphone. Does this reach <laughs> over there? Anyway. All right. <laughs> producer, producer, Nicholas Hamilton, the good Hamilton, the one, the one that doesn't like central banking. Shut up. <laughs> we're right. gonna, we're gonna keep this in. We're, oh no, we're, not, all we're not cutting that. None of this is getting edited. All right, let's go to our first article here, which talks about Mike Lindell says the FBI seized his phone at Hardee's in Mankato, 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 Minnesota. Mankato, Min Mankato, Minnesota. Eh? Yeah, they name they name things kind of weird up there. Actually, oh my gosh, you are such an uncultured. I was about to say mean person. So look, all right. So what's what's the point of this? So obviously, this seems to be all in conjunction with you know things like January six, with you know um, accusations of election fraud, with you know what did what did Trump do? Did he coordinate with these elements that that raided the Capitol, et cetera? And then obviously the the. Other justification for the raid on Malargo was that he had classified materials. So one of the big arguments there is, okay, well, the president can declassify materials. They wave his hand and say, poof, declassified. Uh, plus, there's also, you know, people have pointed out that, um, you know, well, yes, mishandling of classified materials is a bad thing. We all agree that's a bad thing. We pointed out this is a bad thing with Hillary Clinton, who set up an entirely different email server, like on her orders, in order to be able to get classified emails and whatnot, like on, on her personal email, right? Like that's a little different than the White House staff packs up a bunch of boxes and then sends them home with the president when, it, when he leaves office, right? So let, let's, let's be intellectually honest in the differences here between the Secretary of State setting up an, an illegal mail server and then getting classified materials versus, hey, there was classified materials that happened to be in some of these boxes that went home. And then, of course, you know, Howard Stern, who I always trust for careful and, you know, Trustworthy, trustworthy analysis. analysis says that this was all um, Trump's attempt to sell nuclear secrets to Russia. So we have that. And then, you know, Bannon went down. Bannon's going down too, not just for um, actually election stuff. It had to do with like he fundraising. Is, yeah. He's oh, by the fundraising. way, first off, it's um, it's actually pronounced Mankato. I just looked Mankato. it up. But um, 
so uh, the the case with Bannon is apparently he's uh, being accused of like some shady stuff related to donations for building the wall. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that that's what they're trying to get him on. But I I do think that first off. Uh, Hamilton, you were about to say something about Hardee's. Oh, we, 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 we're, we're over that. <laughs> Long story short, um, I do find it very interesting that somebody like Mike Lindell, who I, I don't really know what sort of power or authority he has other than he manages to convince a lot of conservatives to use promo code MyPillow for 15% off or something yeah. like that. By the way, we are not sponsored by MyPillow. Um I'll but make the call. I don't even think that is a promo code. But, like, point is, is that, like, Mike Lindell is just kind of, he's just a media personality, really. Well, he's he's, he's he a claimed, business owner and a media personality. Yeah, he, he claimed that the agents questioned him about Dominion Voting Systems, Mesa County Clerk Tina Peters, and, and his connection to Doug Frank, an Ohio educator who claims voting machines have been, nipul- been manipulated. This is what, what he's saying. Now, Hardy's... <laughs> Hardy's actually put out a tweet that said, now that you know we exist, you should really try our pillowy biscuits. Pillowy <laughs> bi- That's some great marketing yeah, on, their it s- is. on their side. But, but, but what this comes down to is then agents then told Lindell they had a warrant to seize his cell phone and ordered him to turn it over. He said on a video version of his podcast, Lindell displayed a letter signed by an assistant U.S. attorney in Colorado that said prosecutors were conducting an official criminal investigation of a suspected felony and noted the use of a federal grand jury. So it's and he goes on to say the circumstances of the investigation were unclear. The Justice Department did not immediately respond Tuesday night to a request for comment about the seizure or investigation. Now, why his phone though? Like, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. You know, who we potentially could have been in connection with. Um, but but again, we're we're seeing this one by one. Yeah, this it, it, DOJ it, is going after it does their seem, enemies. It does seem to be at some point. You know, when 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 you see some of the things going on and, and the emphasis. Um, and, and it seems to be like this is all concentrated a couple months before a midterm election cycle. Right now, you, you, can, you can make the claim all day long that, well, hey, this is just when it happened. Like, I, I, will, I, I will proudly say that there, there is a universe where all of this is totally on the up and up and it just happens to be that you managed to get the grand jury when you got it and it happened when it happened. And, and yeah, the raid on Mar Largo, it, you know, that... Totally, you can make all that argument. And there's a there's a world where that exists. You start to get a little bit more suspicious when it seems like right before a midterm election, all of these like FBI raids are taking place and and you know getting these various people. It becomes very very hard to not at least assume that okay, do I think it is beyond, you know, the Biden administration to weaponize the DOJ against his conservative opponents? Do I believe it? No, I do not. In, in part, I don't believe that because he lied, right? He came right out and said, I had no advance notice that this raid in Mar-a-Lago was going to... Really? Re- the president of the United States had no advance notice that the FBI was going to raid a previous president of the United States. Does Honey, really I'm sorry, that? but I, I've just got to correct you here. It's not that he lied. He just forgot. He just forgot. <laughs> That's that is much possible. more believable. But here's the thing is, Mike Lindell did mention in a quote that um, the FBI agents that, that dealt with him were actually really nice to him and they they weren't jerks at all. So he was trying to make sure people knew these FBI agents were just following orders. They were just doing their job and they made it pretty clear that they weren't trying to be jerks. What and that? so I feel like this DOJ is really throwing the FBI under the bus here and, and giving them orders that just make the FBI look well, bad. And this is the this is the part too where you know I, I I commented on this early. I said, hey, you know the FBI the the Biden DOJ has assured us they're going to get to the Epstein client list just as soon as they're done raiding the My Pillow guy, right? Because all of us are and I and I said something similar when they raided My Largo. It's like, look, um, I I understand that you've got to you've got to prosecute several different crimes and you know you you can't just stop everything that you're doing with the Department of Justice to go after one thing. But I think a lot of us are curious about things like the Epstein client list. We're, we're curious about some of these other issues. We're, we're, we're not quite sure why it is that when, you know, Hillary Clinton or Stacey Abrams of all these people go around claiming that there's massive election fraud, there doesn't seem to be any, you know, FBI investigations into that. We're not, we're not sure why, you know, Hillary Clinton doesn't get raided when she's deliberately doing something that is obvious mishandling of classified dirt and then takes steps to erase the evidence. And she, she doesn't she have it. any presidential privilege whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so you're, you're looking at all this going... This, this seems to be um, targeted. It seems to be like the law applies one way. So every time they say, well, you know, 
nobody's above the law. Oh, well, really? Except for Hunter Biden, it, right? And it Hillary really Clinton. smacks of Obama using the IRS to target his enemies when he was doing that. Yeah. And, and look, fair yeah. enough. You go back enough time. Richard Nixon did that. But the difference was is Richard Nixon took heat from his own side for yeah, doing it. Yeah, he had it. to resign. Yeah, Richard Nixon took heat from his own side. He had people within his own administration that refused to do it, then testified against him publicly for doing it. Then you see this garbage taking place, and they have the audacity to come out there and say, oh, well, nobody's above the law. Oh, okay. All right. Go go. Uh, <laughs> tell, tell me Hunter isn't above the law at this point. Yeah. Um, exactly. And, well, and so this is especially in light of it was a few weeks ago that there was an FBI whistleblower that came out and said that, like, the agency basically intentionally slow walked any investigation into what Hunter was doing. Yeah. And I, I mean, I mean, they went, they even went around to uh, social media groups and told them to ignore any explosive, you know, information that might be coming out about the Bidens. Um, because it could be Russian misinformation. And so they were intentionally suppressing it at the behest of the FBI. Yes, that is true. But I, I, I also think that it's important to, to recognize that, like, I, I feel like that the Lindell thing is, is in some ways a bit of a distraction because he isn't really as politically powerful as, say, Trump himself is or was he has a pretty solid um, following well yes but but at the end of the day like lindell is really known for you know all of his claims about voter fraud and him selling my pillows like he's not the leader of a political party he's not a major elected public official right he he's none of those things and so i, I well, like, can, can I, uh, to get a little conspiratorial here i mean lindell lindell did do a massive you know, conference where he had people coming around and it was on YouTube and it was everybody presenting evidence for why they thought voter fraud took place and all yeah. this. So it's it's not as if he's just another Republican donor, right? He, he really he really put in a lot of money, time, and effort in kind of investigating the voter fraud side and has been very prominent in that and has been canceled from various platforms as a result of that. Um, but I, I think that, you know, the, the other thing that's interesting about this is that when you when you look at midterms, here's what you end up seeing. The more the conversation is about like Mike Lindell or Trump or Steve Bannon or the FBI rating it, the worse Republicans do on the generic ballot. That's why I said it sounds like right. he's being he's a distraction because yes. he's not he's not a giant political rallying force for Republicans no. so much as he is a target that Democrats can use to say, see, this is why we need to elect more Democrats because they're going to hold the election deniers or threats to democracy accountable. Yeah. And as long as they can paint people like him or Trump or any of these other people as threats to democracy, what this is, is the left has decided that, well, they know they can't run on the economy. They know that they can't run any any sort of legislative record. Yeah. And so the only thing that they can run on is basically scaremongering people into thinking the fascists will take over unless you vote for us. Well, and I think that's where people get incredibly skeptical of would Joe Biden be willing to use the Department of Justice or would people within the Biden administration be willing to use the Department of Justice in, in, for political purposes? And, and I'm sorry, I just I don't think that's beyond them at all. No, he did. He did say that. Um, the American people, in order to fight the government, would need an F, <laughs> F-15s, F- and F-15s and nukes. Yeah, right. Well, but he also – well, here's the other thing that – here's the other thing where this this provides, I would say, an argument for why all this seems to be happening like right now, just a couple months beforehand. It's why they, they started the January 6th hearings, and then they said, okay, well, we're going to we're gonna put this on hold for a little bit, and then right. we're going to pick it back up a little bit later in the year. Oh, when? Like October maybe? So – this is the part where people look at all of this, the compounding evidence, the, in, the, in, the inductive principle comes into play here where I stack up all the evidence. They say, wait a second. You know, it, you guys have seen the trend here. When, when, the, when it is Joe Biden getting up there and talking about things, when it's Kamala Harris getting up there and talking about things, when it's Chuck Schumer getting up there and talking about things, whether it's the border, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's inflation, whether it's this, you know, fascist-esque speech that he gave in front of, in, in, in Philadelphia, with a, where a red background of Marines where he's talking about MAGA Republicans are the enemy right. of, you know, democracy. He tanks. Like, they're, 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 their election prospects start to tank whenever they are in the forefront. And so they're desperately been trying to get anything they possibly can to put, you know, what, what they perceive to be is, is bad messaging for Republicans out there. And every time there's a new, you know, FBI confiscation raid, whatever it is, the news cycle inevitably switches to that. What percentage of Americans do you think are paying enough attention 
to see that they're moving the January 6th, you know, hearings later down the, you know, they're ca- not. calendar. No, very, very small. Very, very, very small. small. Look, the, you've got here. Let's just say you got 20 percent of the population that already knows what they, or 20 to 30 percent already completely knows what they think about the January 6th hearings right. one way or the other. Um, in fact, I would argue that's probably closer to like 50 percent of the population. Then you've got other people that just don't care like at all. And then you've got other people where what it does is it provides a sentiment. So what it, people are busy right now, especially with inflation being so high and everything else, people are busy right now focusing on the things that mean the most to them with respect to their jobs, with respect to paying for groceries, gas prices, you know, their kids back in school, like all of that is what's focusing on their intention. But they have a sentiment associated with various things, right? So if, if you're a, if a, a moderate voter that isn't very involved and you, you, you're furious about inflation, but you also don't like, you know, Trump's tweets. Right. You know, whatever's being talked about in the news that it's kind of like this background noise, but it's creating an, 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 an overall sentiment or impression on what you think. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, again, that's where... You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of in 2016, um, whoever was being talked about in the news cycle the most, their standing in the polling went down. When the news cycle was yeah. was focused on Hillary Clinton, her standing in the polls dropped, and then when it shifted to Trump, it dropped as well. Which is why, by the way, Joe Biden decided to hide in a basement during the 2020 election cycle because he looked at his predecessor who ran four years earlier and said, oh, so whenever I'm in the news, I'm going to get hammered in the polls for it. So let me sit back and be quiet. And then from his perspective, he was going to hope that Trump was going to destroy himself. And I think that that mentality in many ways is still at play within – Um, political parties today. This goes back to what I was saying earlier that like, I think the left has made this calculated decision that, you know what, if we can get certain people in the news cycle enough, we can shift the attention away from the fact that you can't buy eggs at the grocery store anymore. Yeah. And you can get it towards the idea that, oh, well, I remember, I remember the Mr. Pillow man said all these, from my perspective, you know, me as a moderate voter, from my perspective, Mr. Pillow man said all these wacky things in 2020 and now he's back in the news cycle. I forgot about him, but now I remember. And then you've got away the horrible economy and the horrible news that just came out yesterday versus people that you don't really like that keep showing up in the news cycle. Well, and your, your overall, your, you're justifiably angry about these things that are going on. It's a question of where do you associate the blame for those things and if, and if you've got the news constantly hammering in on, on particular entities or personalities, it's easy to associate your your specific frustration over here with a more general frustration. And let's face it, nobody likes politicians, and, and generally for good reason. Yeah. Um, well, Nick, what about the claim that, you know, the left would consider us or are calling us hypocrites because we are pro law enforcement, but we're also saying, oh, defund the police. We're not saying that, but there are people on our side that are saying, saying defund the FBI, yeah. you know, after this story. What are your thoughts on that? So here's what it, so for, for some of them, the, the accusation that conservatives in general are hypocrites on this, that we like law enforcement when they're, you know, in the, in the minds of the left, we love law enforcement when they're shutting down peaceful protests Right, but we hate law enforcement when they're raiding Donald Trump. And and if you look at the way certain conservatives react to it, it's not hard for them to make this caricature sure. of conservatism in general. Now, th- this is the part where I-, I think this is really important for conservatives when we're making the argument about what is our disposition toward the government and law enforcement. Um, now, th- there's a whole longer, larger conversation to have about kind of the left's view of criminal justice and the right's view of criminal justice, but. Let's just focus specifically on the police. What's our disposition toward the police? Typically speaking, when you say back the blue, that doesn't mean, well, hey, any any cop that's a jerk and, and you know, beats up a suspect or plants evidence, you know what, I don't care, back the blue. That's not what that means. Right. Typically what we're talking about is is this, this general sentiment toward law enforcement within the United States and within a free society, and that's the idea that – we want to see our law enforcement as these are officers that are from our community that are there to protect us, that when we call them up in the middle of the night in a dangerous situation, right, they're going to show up there in order to protect you or your family member uh, or your child, right? And we also respect that that's a dangerous job. So it, it's the idea that they're willing to put themselves into dangerous, potentially deadly situations in order to protect us. And, and there's, a, there's a natural degree of respect that is conveyed to someone that is willing to take that risk. That's why you see that sentiment toward the military. Right. 
The reason why it's generally more easy for us to convey that to the military than law enforcement is that the military doesn't arrest us or give us speeding tickets or, or you know, it's give us point. fines or fees. Unless they're an MP. Right. <laughs> law, there's a story there. Anyway, I, I've had a couple. Can, can we can we hear law, that story? Law enforcement. Not right now. Law enforcement does. OK. And, and so th there's the there's the possibility, whereas you're probably only going to have, you know, generally speaking, favorable interactions with the military if you're a U.S. citizen you could have both a favorable or an unfavorable action with law enforcement, not to mention that it's a huge responsibility. The, the other thing that I think conservatives usually distinguish here is we distinguish between rank and file officers and their leadership. And we distinguish between rank and file officers and the politicians that make the laws. True. So for instance, one of my favorite sayings with law enforcement, I said, law enforcement has to live at the business end of a lot of stupid ideas that politicians have. I'll give you a perfect example of this up in New York. Um, who was the who was the suspect that died because he was selling? Oh gosh, I forgot his name. Eric Garner. Eric Garner. So Eric Garner, the, New York had passed a bunch of laws raising taxes on cigarettes, not specifically to raise revenue. It was more to dissuade people from smoking cigarettes. So they raised the taxes so high that they actually created a black market for cigarettes in New York City, where people would go across state lines, buy a bunch of cigarettes, and they would literally sell. They would come to Virginia. Individual, yeah, individual cigarettes at a time, like on the street. Right. So law enforcement had interaction. This guy was technically breaking the law. The, the, all the politicians that voted for those tax increases and voted to make it illegal to sell cigarettes like that. They voted to tell law enforcement to go and stop that from happening. This guy resisted arrest, was put in a chokehold. He ended up dying of complications. The same Democrats that passed that law immediately said, oh, these police are horrible. Like as a conservative, I will look at that and be like, OK, before you start blaming the police for enforcing a law that you supported, maybe we should take into account the second and third order effects of the law, right? So I'm, my, my first inclination is not to trash the guy that you told to go out there and do this. My first, my first responsibility is to look at the leadership or the legislator that made that interaction possible in the first place. So we make a distinction there. We also make a distinction between the leadership within organizations and the rank of, again, the guys that are carrying out the thing. So it's not just the politicians. It's also the chief. It's the administrators. It's the commissioner. It's all these other people that are pushing a particular climate or agenda within the department. So when I'll give you an example of this on the military side. When General Milley gets out there and is pushing all this woke BS at the military academy or within the military, our first inclination isn't to say, well, we need to defund the 82nd Airborne right. Division. It's like that guy isn't punk. So those are some of the distinctions that are made. Now, I, I will tell you this much. If you're a conservative and your attitude is like, I'm going to back the blue unequivocally until something happens that I don't like, you are guilty of hypocrisy. Right. You are guilty of what the left is accusing you of. We should be able to make a distinction which says we can respect that this is a dangerous job. We have respect for the people that are willing to do it. But we also expect in a free society that you're going to do it within certain parameters and that you're going to do it with the respect for the Constitution. Right. That's a that's a fair that is a fair and intellectually honest and consistent position to take. And and we need to take that position. Uh, but so I, I would say that insofar as the left is accusing people of doing that, who are not who are doing a bad job clearly articulating their position, that that accusation is going to stick. But when you're talking about conservatism overall, no, there, there's nothing wrong with someone saying I have a general support for people that put on the badge and are willing to do dangerous things on behalf uh, to protect society, while at the same time can express skepticism and even distrust at times for the leadership of those organizations, for the politicians that create the laws I don't agree with, or for individual officers that have conducted themselves in such a way that is antithetical to what their mission is. There's a lot being... Boom! Right, right. We'll cut that into a clip and put it on YouTube. <laughs> so I've got... I've got a follow-up question um, related to your answer that you just gave there, and that's when the left goes out there and says, like, like, like to, to flip it around, yeah. because I always like, like, like doing that when somebody says, oh, well, you support X, but not Y, and then I'm like, okay, but you support Y, but not X. Um, isn't it quite interesting that the same people that have spent you know, 2020, you know, saying all cops are bastards or abolish the police, defund the police. And, and in many cities actually got away with with things that either defunded the police or tried to outright abolish local police departments are now going out there cheerleading for the FBI to throw the book at people like Trump or, you know, Lindell or any of these other people out there. I I do think that that's something that that, quite frankly, I think that there's a lot of conservatives 
that are playing defense more than offense. They're always responding to an attack from the left and saying, no, 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 I'm not this. I'm not racist or I'm not bigoted or I'm I'm not in favor of that. When I'm, you know, and we you get this in a lot of social issues. Abortion's another one too, where you know an attack is thrown out there, and, and Republicans or conservatives like to play defense rather than turning around and being like, well, hold on for a second. I've always been consistent on X, Y, and Z. Where's your consistency when it comes to those things? Why why is it that when stories like this come out, the response on the right is always to play defense and to say, you know, to, to either try to make excuses for what happened or to defend Trump rather well, than attack the left's hypocrisy when it comes to the same people that are rooting for the FBI right now were the people that were against any sort of local law enforcement two years ago, and in many cases still are against local well, I, law I, enforcement. I think, there's, I think there's two things with that. One, I think you are starting to see conservatives go on the offense more. I, I, don't, I do think you're starting to see more conservatives calling out the hypocrisy on the left on these things and, and calling out the obvious intellectual inconsistencies. By the same token, the way the media treats it is very differently. Yeah. So, for instance, when, when we discuss a particular topic, you, we can make a you know, kind of a flippant remark and we generally understand where the other person is coming from. So we, we, don't, we don't deeply scrutinize. So we say back the blue, we don't deeply scrutinize anyone at this table because we all understand that when we say back the blue, we only mean that with uncertain conditions. And those can, but those conditions have also been articulated. We've, we've expressed what those are. Back the blue doesn't mean a cop can do whatever they want and we're fine with it as long as they wear a badge. We don't, we don't agree with that. We are skeptical of authority in general, government authority. Now, uh, on the left, what's interesting is that the press seems to kind of give them the, the same sort of, well, they didn't, what they really mean is this. And I see that all the time. It's like, well, no, this, they're just being passionate. This is a mostly peaceful protest. Yeah. They're, fiery, they're just, but, pe but mostly yeah, peaceful. Fiery, yeah. but peaceful, right? They're, they're just, they're just expressing their anger, but the underlying message of what they're talking about is absolutely true and good and whatnot. And they just take that for granted. And, and that's, that's what you see in a lot of this. And I do think it, it also expresses kind of a, a, a significant difference in the way that the left and the right view law enforcement. Um, it, it's not that the left are anti-law enforcement. Go look at every predominantly leftist regime in, in world history. They and what you're gonna find is oh, they're very pro-law enforcement. Oh, yeah. That's why I would say the left doesn't hate <laughs> guns. They just don't want you to own one. Right? Well, I mean, their definition of gun control is only people that work for the state or that agree with them should have guns. It, like, it like, seems like to me that they love law enforcement agencies where the power is very centralized from the top. Well, yeah. it's not just where the power is. It's what the power is doing. And yeah. I think that's to the point okay. of what Nick was trying to say there because when the powers that be are enforcing the left's utopian vision of society – either in a brutal communist regime or in a progressive case. I know that we've got this story about San Francisco, yeah, and I think you're going to talk about yeah. it for a second. I, when the left is, it has that, that central authority, has that, that you know, law enforcement power, and that law enforcement power is explicitly being directed towards left-wing goals. In the United States, it's mostly built around things like equity and stuff yeah. like that. They're totally okay. They're totally okay with with the police, they're not in favor of abolishing it. They're in favor of using the police because they think that these law enforcement agencies are another tool in their, their toolbox to achieve a certain end. And that end is not liberty or justice or equality before the law or freedom or any of those principles that, that have been enshrined in our constitution. It's always a, it's, it's always a, a policy goal um, that, that is completely separate from, from a, a set of principles. And I, I think that, well, you so, told me about this story that's going on in, what was it? There was a story in Iowa and there's yeah, a story in San we, Francisco. We can, well, so we, we already know what happened in like San Francisco. We had, there they, San Francisco recalled their district attorney. It was a big Soros backed guy. And it's amazing. Anytime you say that, yeah, Soros backed this guy, like, oh, you're anti-Semitic. Like, no, it's just an obvious fact that George Soros has a particular theory when it comes to criminal justice, the criminal justice system. He thinks it's systemically racist. He thinks it's inherently bad. He thinks that a lot of the people that get prosecuted and incarcerated and whatnot, you know, shouldn't be. And so he actively uses his resources to help get district attorneys, commonwealth attorneys. He's done um, that here in attorneys. Virginia. He's done it here in Virginia, in Fairfax and Loudoun County. He did it in San Francisco. Now, what was so surprising was that San Francisco got so bad that they actually recalled the district attorney there. I yeah. mean, that's, you're, you're talking about, San Francisco is considered one of the biggest liberal bastions out there. They got the, the district attorney that theoretically, you know, matched was, their values, matched their values. And within a relatively short period of time, they're like, you know what? 
I don't like homeless encampments in front of my schools, and I don't like walking through fecal matter to get to the store. Oh, and by the way, I don't like it when people are smashing and grabbing in, in all the stores that I go to and, and creating a situation where I don't feel safe with my family. We need to get rid of this guy. And, and what did that DA said? He, well, we can't arrest our way out of the problem. I keep hearing this. Well, yeah. Guess what you also can't do? You can't let criminals run rampant through your society and, and have that address the problem either. And so you're, you're starting to see this backlash. You saw it in San Francisco. There's also this case that the uh, the everyone's talking about, but we got the Daily Wire article. This judge throws Soros back prosecutor off of case against Loudon rape victim's father. I remember this story. Oh this my is gosh. one of the things that, for, for those of you not in Virginia, this is one of the things that um, in some ways tilted the outcome towards Yunkin at the eleventh hour. Oh yeah, last well, year. And, and you you see this case you see this case up in Loudon here where you this was the one that um, this was the one that went viral when all of the the major media outlets were essentially saying that you know this father just came in and essentially disrupted a school board meeting and was threatening them and this is why you know the National School Board Association calling for the Department of Justice to investigate. They were calling for the National Guard to come up. Oh and yeah, when they tackled meetings. him in the middle of the meeting, yeah, and his shirt was pulled up and everything else, and like they had him on the ground and. They t- they took this image of him like that. You know, it's 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 not a, a it's flattering, not a great image. It's right, not yeah. a flattering image. And I remember seeing people that lean to the left, not even f- hardcore leftists, lean to the left, um, saying, "Well, look at these. Ki- th- these are the kind of hicks that are showing up yeah. at our school board meetings, and you're you're on the side of these, you know, MAGA." You well, know, it, knuckle draggers, and that's how they painted this guy. And then when the truth came out, crickets. Oh, they yeah. didn't say a word. They didn't apologize. Yeah. They didn't say a word. Well, and there's a reason why the judge is throwing this prosecutor off of this case. It's because of the way that they treated him was horrible. And then you go to this latest case in Iowa, where we have a teen trafficking victim. So, so keep in mind, I don't know a lot about this this county attorney and in. in um, in Iowa, in um, oh, what what county is it? In it Iowa? was uh, Polk County. Polk County, Iowa. Or this is where Des Moines is. is. Yeah. So th- this guy, he's a Democrat um, county attorney. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like their, city. Kind of like their district attorney. He's been um, he's been the prosecutor there for for a long time. Well, this teen trafficking victim was ordered to pay one hundred and fifty thousand in restitution to the family of the rape of her rapist. This is disgusting that she killed. Now. You're looking at this, and initially when you read it, you're thinking, this judge is a moron. Actually, and this is the part where it's important for conservatives to read in and actually understand right. how the law works. There's such a thing. In some cases, you have things like mandatory minimums or you have mandatory restitution that's required. And a lot of the reasons why these mandatory minimums have been put in place is because you have what they consider to be weak judges, and you don't want people getting out early for, for heinous crimes. Now, the problem with mandatory minimums is that you also create a situation where you, you do take away a judge's discretion, right? So mandatory minimums are essentially put on there to, to kind of combat what it ultimately is liberal discretion on the, on the bench. The problem is you get a situation like this where everyone's trashing this judge. Like, how could you possibly sentence this, this girl to this? And how could she have to pay all this you know, money? It's like, he goes, I don't have a choice. Like, by law, by Iowa law, I have to require it. Here's what, would, but here's what happened. So this girl was trafficked from the time I think she was like 15, maybe even younger. So the the person that uh, abducted her. So <clears throat> here's the deal: a teenage sex trafficking victim who stabbed her accused rapist to death was ordered to pay $150,000 in restitution to the man's family and sentenced to five years of closely supervised provision by a, or probation by a judge in Iowa on Tuesday. Uh, Piper Lewis was a 15-year-old runaway when she stabbed her 37-year-old abuser, Zachary Brooks, more than 30 times in a Des Moines apartment in June 2020. Lewis, now 17, was originally charged with first-degree murder for the fatal stabbing. Last year, she pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter and will for injury. Each charge is punishable by up to 10 years in prison. Now, the judge did what he could with respect to the prison sentence, right? And and I guess there's been some other issues uh <clears throat> for the girl, she's she's been in uh, juvenile detention before. But here's the issue. 15-year-old is being regularly trafficked. What does that mean? It means that this adult man, who had a child, by the way, this adult man <clears throat> essentially grabbed this girl who was, who was living on the streets, trafficked her to other men, and then raped her himself. And then one night while she was sleeping, <clears throat> or while he was sleeping, 
She stabbed him to death. Well, okay, hold on. He brought her to the hotel room at knife point. And oh, yeah, he would be violently. Yeah, and so she used the knife yeah. that he forced her to go in there with him with to yeah. kill him. So that's a really important detail. Now and and now, so here's what happened: the prosecutor, and this this goes down on the county attorney because the the county attorney has has what they call prosecutorial discretion. They can essentially look at the circumstances of a crime and say, okay, the law says X, Y, and Z, but in every case, we actually allow for discretion within law enforcement to be able to look at certain things and say, ah, we, we don't think this is appropriate to go for this. He went after first degree murder for her. And the and the, the excuse was Who's he? The the uh, prosecutor. Okay. So again, all the prosecutors serve underneath the county attorney. Okay. So the county attorney does get to set kind of the, the, the mood or the culture within the office. And so the prosecutor went after first-degree murder. Her defense team said, you should plead to you know, this, this lesser charge of manslaughter. <clears throat> and everyone is looking at this going, this poor 15-year-old was raped and brutally you know, uh, oppressed and, and beaten by this guy. I feel like her her and defense it, attorney did her a huge disservice, huge disservice by service suggesting that. Be, because again, once you once you plea out, and again for a prosecutor, you're like, I'm going to start the charge here, knowing that if I can get you to plea out to this, I get a victory. It looks like I got yep, a prosecution. That's exactly what happened. I got a prosecution here, right? That's that's in that's in my win column. The defense attorney also gets a win because they pled to a lesser charge. Right, so now there's this environment. So created. she was just getting used. Now there's this environment created where they, they went after her for all this, and and I'm looking at this, and, and again the judge to some degree tried to suspend what he could, but then the prosecutors said, well I we don't prosecutor actually said that well we're not comfortable with you describing her as a victim because you know she wasn't in immediate danger. This is according to the prosecution when she stabbed this guy and she deprived that that person's child of a father and doesn't show a lot of regret. I'm looking at this going, show me you're an idiot without, or tell me you're an idiot without telling me you're an idiot. Because as I'm looking at this prosecutor going, this is the whole reason why you have prosecutorial discretion. It's to look at a unique set of circumstances and facts and then come to the conclusion that either A, we're not going to prosecute, or B, we're not going to go after the, the worst charge possible. They did the opposite. They said, we're giving you first murder one. We're giving you murder one unless you play out. And this poor girl is sitting there potentially facing up to life in prison for stabbing a rapist to death. Right? This is the sort of thing where we look at this and oh by the way, the prosecutor the, the county uh, attorney who's been there for like 21 years, he's been a Democrat uh, county attorney. There's now a three there was a three-way Democrat primary. Guess who won the Democrat primary? I'm assuming Soros back candidate. It was the Soros backed yeah. candidate. Is is now won the Democratic primary, and, and if the history is anything, that, they're gonna she's gonna win. That leads me to my last question for this episode, which is, what do you say to somebody on the left that says, you know, I I agree with you on this, Nick, yeah. that this wasn't fair, and that's why we should have prosecu uh, um uh um prosecutorial discretion and judicial but discretion. What do you know? But where are you when it comes to, you know, all, you know, you're at out there attacking all of these, you know, prosecutors in these blue localities that are deciding that we don't want to prosecute these nonviolent crimes, you know, these either nonviolent drug or petty offense crimes. Um, like, what do you say to somebody on the left that tries to spin this around and say, oh, I agree with you on this, but you don't agree with me, you know, when it comes sure. to the discretion of the prosecutor in Loudoun or Fairfax yeah. or Arlington. So, so here's the decision. First of all, I would say that I've carried criminal justice reform legislation before. So this idea that I want to lock everybody up or I want you to go to jail for a joint, that, that does describe some conservatives. It does not describe me. That's the first point. The second point I would make is that from a conservative perspective, here's the distinction. If somebody, like let's say, vandalizes something or steals something or breaks something, you have created a victim. So this is not a victimless crime. Mm -hmm. Now, there are other things that you can do that break the law that don't create a victim. Speeding is technically breaking the law, but you can speed. Most people speed throughout their life, right? And don't hurt anybody in the process. Somebody might engage like, uh, like for instance, maybe you had too, many, too much to drink and you were a little bit loud in public. Well, did you really create a victim when you did that? Or maybe someone decided to use drugs, an illegal narcotic. 
Okay, again, you can ask the question. It's not to say that it's good behavior. It's not to say that somebody might not be hurt emotionally from it. It's not to say that you don't hurt yourself. But have you really created a victim in the same way that you have as robbing someone? When you've robbed or, someone, yeah. when you've beaten someone, when or you've sex stolen from them, when you've someone. engaged in sex trafficking. I would say the answer is most conservatives look at that and we make a distinction right. between those crimes which create victims which are entitled to restitution versus those people that do not. Now, we might even be more we might even be more willing for uh, you know more discretion or, or allowing the judge more leeway when we say that, okay, you know what? This 18-year-old who has been beaten all of his life at home um, has been basically raised in a gang culture. And, and this you know what this kid did? He, he, he broke into a store at night and he stole some stuff and then he, and then he fenced it. We might be willing to say, you know what? We're going we're gonna to cut this kid some slack. We're not going to totally let him get away with it because he created a victim. Mm-hmm. But we're going to cut the kids some slack because we understand that the circumstances they grew up didn't set them up with much of a chance. And we want to see if there's a better way right. to be able to achieve restitution for his victims who are entitled to justice while at the same time understanding the surrounding circumstances. Right? We, we yeah. can make that distinction. Here's what we don't get about this at all and why we will never put it on the same plane. This woman did not was not a victim of sex trafficking and then went out and hurt somebody else or stole from a target or set a building on fire or spray painted a building. This woman killed the person that was brutally beating and raping her. And now you want to treat that guy like he's the victim? Oh, well, you know, gosh, his kid's growing up without a father. You know, I don't mean to sound too blunt on this one, but in this particular case, might be better if this kid finds a different father. Their excuse yeah. was that he had fallen asleep and was powerful. no longer. Yeah, he, he had, had fallen, fallen asleep, asleep, asleep and, and was no, no longer a threat. Well, that, you know what? I, I got a question for this prosecutor. Your 15-year-old daughter is now being trafficked by someone and being held captive. And she's been brutally raped. Not only that, but the person that's brutally raping her has farmed, farmed her out to her buddies to be brutally raped. And then that guy falls asleep and leaves the knife that he's used to intimidate your daughter on the table. And she gives up and stabs him in order to escape. You're going to prosecute her with what, murder one? Oh, well, they County think- attorney? No, I'm pretty damn sure you're not. And that's the part where, again, we make a distinction. In this case, this woman had to make, this girl, not even a woman, this girl had to make a calculated decision on if I get away, will he get me back? If I wake him up, will he beat me? Will he kill me? Is will he, he rape me, me again? Down? Will he chase me down? Yeah. I can't defend myself, but I got one shot, one shot only to potentially neutralize the threat to my life. And a prosecutor looked at that and said, I think we can get a conviction off of this. No, I'm, I'm sorry. You show me a conservative that's going to look at that and say, well, she broke the law. You know what? This is par for the course. Because the left is always incredibly soft on sex crime. Just look at Epstein. Epstein is yeah. another situation. We don't even know who's on or this list now. They're at- protecting people. I mean, I there's certainly many conservatives that would argue, quite frankly, that the left in some ways is perpetuating sex crimes because look at at look how do I phrase this without not sounding very mean? Look at what the left is doing promoting things with children. Yeah. Yeah. Right now. You, you're not going to find anyone on the right saying we should use the term minor attracted persons yes. instead of pedophile. Yes. That is not a right Those are thing. college professors yeah. that, that are doing that. Thing. You're not going to see anybody on the right being like, and I want my the, kids at, to see kink. Look at all of the, the public. drag queen story hours out there and all of the, the pride parade stuff. And, and, and again, it, it, 10 years ago, it wasn't what it currently is now. Now it's the left has gone from simply saying, you know, please accept my existence to I want to teach your kids about something. Yeah. Oh yeah, they'll set up a stripper pole in the middle of the street. And, and I'm not saying help that your everybody child on the left to, is no, doing no, no, that, no. but but there there is a trend where where I mean the, and, and this is becoming something that's in the public limelight now. And so I well and can I to your point, can I mention something here? Most people have this impression of sex trafficking as or, or the only what the image that immediately comes to mind and what what kind of controls their whole thought process of this is this was you know some kid that was trafficked across the border or somebody that was put in a connex over in China and then shipped over here and it's got a lot of it's domestic a, not only is it domestic what they need to understand is a lot of it doesn't start off as somebody coming and kidnapping your kid putting him in a burlap sack it's somebody you know a it, lot of it's times it's not even that <laughs> it is somebody that has essentially groomed a child who has voluntarily gone with them 
because they believe they can give their consent to do this. They believe that 13, 14, 15, they can give their consent because they've been taught that they can yeah. do that. And then it, it's only after it's only after the fact that they realize this is not what they wanted. But, the, but this idea that everything is a is a van with no windows that says free candy on the side, scooping up your kid at the park because that's, you weren't paying attention for a second. How, that's not how that's this not an out. accurate yeah. reflection of how a lot of this happens. Well, Nick, the, and, the, and and you and, and I'm sorry, but we do have a right as conservatives to be concerned when there's this over, there seems to be this overwhelming desire yeah. by certain people, certain elements on the left to open up discussions about sexual preferences and ideas and experimentation at yeah, going such into young the ages. whole map thing and uh, yeah. I, I I know that that we're short for time and I feel bad for potentially stealing the limelight from from Hamilton for a second but I've got to ask this question because I really think that this sums up everything that we've just talked about today and that is what does this and the FBI thing the stuff in San Francisco the stuff that we've talked about today what does this explain about the differences between the left and the right when it comes to law enforcement, policing, the role of government in society? What What, what is the difference? Where? How, explain somebody like you and I, where we're coming from when it comes to this stuff versus somebody on the left and, and where we're clashing. Why are we not looking at these type of things through the same lens? I, I think there's a fundamental difference on who we perceive as the victim in many of these cases. So, for instance, if, if you're someone on the left and you believe you have totally bought into the idea that America is a systematically racist, corrupt institution, that when law enforcement does something, when, when law enforcement enforces a crime, especially against someone that you believe fits within an oppressor class, you, you automatically view that with skepticism and you assume that there was either racist or corrupt intentions behind it. And so you're, you're more likely to look at that particular incident with skepticism. Now, if you're on the right... You're, you're more likely to look at something where like, okay, what, what, are the, what is the nature of the circumstances in which someone got arrested? Oh, they, they beat somebody. They stole from somebody. They, you know, they burned down a store. They vandalized. They were rioting. Like for us, that all just seems like, yeah, you, you violated something. Uh, for the left, they're looking at like, well, wait a second. Is this a, is this a member of a marginalized population? And what were the circumstances that potentially led them into that situation? Now, you, you can look at all that and look at those as legitimate questions. The question is, is that, what does that then mean for the way that you want to organize your criminal justice system? And, and what we've seen overwhelmingly is that their skepticism starts with the system itself, um, with the, the members of that system, and with the, the law in general. So if, if, you're, if your starting point is, is this is all corrupt, evil, racist, sexist, bigoted, part of a, 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 a scheme to promote white supremacy— well, then, yeah, your, your standpoint is not going to be to look at the, the facts of the evidence that took place when the crime happened. It's going to be look at a, a whole, you know, culture and system and, and, and blame those things or at least consider them to be overwhelming contributing factors, which means that we as society are guilty for what this person has done. If you're a conservative, you don't assume that society is overall to blame when somebody commits a crime. You can certainly look at circumstances of an individual case and say, I can understand why this might be a contributing factor. But one of our first questions is, is did you create a victim out of an innocent person? So even if we think that you're justified in your anger at a, a, a particular injustice, the moment you hurt an innocent third party, we say, no, 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 that's not acceptable. The left doesn't necessarily do that because, wait, you got insurance. right? It's, it's not worth the social progress that is being made by the, the target being looted to be upset about that because this is more, this is about a bigger issue. We're saying that, no, 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 the little issues matter as well. But we also, I, I would argue that um, at least conservatives on what you might call more the liberty side of conservatism, yeah, we don't want to throw people in jail for, for you know, victimless crimes, or we don't want to throw people in jail for things that we don't think rise to that, the level of incarceration. But we're also very sensitive to the fact that the whole reason why we have Government, right? The only legitimate justification for government, in our view, is not the organization of society in order to make sure that some bureaucracy is telling us how to run the economy or run education or run healthcare. No, it's we're we've organized a government in order to protect individual liberties, property rights, in order to ensure that voluntary transaction can take place without living in constant fear of either the criminal down the street or the barbarian horde you know, taking over your society and creating an, an environment where none of us feel safe. So the idea that we would, the idea that we would look at a victim in a particular case 
and say that, well, because, you know, maybe this kid had a bad upbringing or because there were circumstances that, that adversely affected their decision making, therefore they're not guilty, we're guilty. That doesn't make any sense to us. Yeah. It, it's a factor to consider, it, but it, is not res, it does not absolve someone of their responsibility. And so I really think, and if I, if I had to sum all this up very quickly, it would be this. If you have a worldview that seeks to protect individual liberty, you also place a very high premium on personal responsibility. If you have a worldview that focuses more on this idea of the collective, then you don't place as significant a, uh, an emphasis on personal responsibility. You put it more on this idea of collective responsibility. Yeah. So individual responsibility, individual blame, individual merit, individual... Collective responsibility, collective blame, collective merit, et cetera. Not to mention the fact that what we've seen over and over again is that they honestly believe that the way that they're going to achieve the ideal society is through. It, it's not through the voluntary cooperation within the marketplace. It's not through it – is, it is by convincing enough people to create the laws that they think that will achieve the desired end state. And what they have demonstrated over and over again is that if that means letting people with violent – you know, past and tendencies out of jail, they're willing to do it because they think it actually serves a larger, more noble purpose. And we do not. And, and as long as we have this conflict within the way that we view criminal justice, we're going to continue to see a situation, I believe, where people that have been victims of crime take a lower priority with the left than the people that have actually perpetrated those crimes, provided that the, the perpetrator of the crime falls within one of their protected classes. And I think that's the major that's the major disconnect. Well, All Hamilton, right. I hated. To oh no, it was have a great question. The- <laughs> it was a great answer. All right, so listen. Thank you very much for for joining us on on this episode. Please leave us a comment. Let us know if you if you think this was valuable. If you think that we arguments that we made and the, and the questions that we addressed. That was one quote we talked about beforehand that we really wanted to address is the yeah. left calling us hypocrites when we say back the blue and then defund the FBI. Right. We want to make sure that we're actually providing a good and intellectually honest argument for this. Right. We do not want to be just another conservative outlet that just simply says, oh, well, it's it's different when we do it. No, it isn't. We have to be intellectually honest and consistent, and what we believe needs to align with the truth, not just what we happen to find politically convenient at the time. I hope we were able to achieve that for you today. Please leave us a comment, go on our volley chat, and we will see you next episode.